A uh, warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today for this webinar on countering transnational organized crime, entitled Understanding Resilience to Transnational Organized Crime, the, role of law, the Roles of Financial Flows, Corruption, and Oversights. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law at the Africa Center. I am pleased to be moderating this webinar. And thank you to everyone once again from across the Africa Center alumni community coming to us with different military and civilian backgrounds within and outside of the security sector. We're very pleased to have so many of you with us today for this important discussion. Uh, this is part of a webinar series about professional development for countering transnational organized crime in Africa. This is a series that we've been offering since October of 2020 and that will continue through July of this year. We thank those who have attended the previous webinars and welcome newcomers to this one. And um, this, these sets of webinars are for a wide variety of alumni, those who have limited knowledge of transnational organized crime um, and those with a great deal of knowledge because they're doing everyday work on this. So we urge all of you to ask questions um, that will help to improve our understanding of transnational organized crime. And for those who have a wealth of experience, we encourage you to share your perspectives with us as well. Just a short bit about the Africa Center, as you all know, as alumni, these webinars are informed by our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions to security challenges. This mission is guided by the Africa Center vision, which is to advance security for all Africans, championed by effective institutions, accountable to their citizens. So we hope that your participation in these webinars with us will contribute to that, that vision and, and, and the mission um, that we share as we walk alongside you. To remind ourselves for the benefit of those who were not with us for some of the previous parts of this webinar series, the series on professional development to counter transnational organized crime is looking to expand understanding of transnational organized crime on the continent and ways to counter it, to facilitate some strategic diagnoses and responses to transnational organized crime, to introduce you to some new data and information on transnational organized crime in Africa, as well as methods and approaches for monitoring it. Uh, and hopefully um, we will help to generate new practical insights on how to build and strengthen the resilience of African states that are trying to counter transnational organized crime. So for more information about the webinar series, for videos from the past uh, webinars, you can please visit our website link that is being provided in the Zoom chat. Now, um, as for today's webinar, um, our first webinar focused on introducing the Organized Crime Index, which is this tool that the ENACT Consortium, Interpol, Institute for Security Studies Africa, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, published. And this tool analyzes criminal actors, criminal markets, vulnerabilities to transnational organized crime that African states are facing, but it also identifies 12 resilience factors that shape state response to transnational organized crime. And so our subsequent webinars in the series have looked at these actors, these markets, and these resilience factors in much greater depth. And so today's webinar is touching on three of these 12 resilience factors identified on the organized crime index. Um, government transparency and accountability, anti-money laundering efforts, and economic regulatory enforcement efforts. So all of these elements influence how corruption, uh, criminality, um, and commercial activities related to illicit financial flows are intertwined with transnational organized crime. So I hope that by the end of the webinar, we will have had an interesting discussion of why and how these different factors are important influences on resilience. And hopefully we will also identify some of the current successes and challenges that African states face in um, using um, these different, um, assessing and dealing with these different factors to dismantle uh, criminal networks. Let me introduce our three distinguished panelists. These are highly regarded experts who will help us develop these points based on their wealth of knowledge and experience and various domains. You have their full biographies on the webinar website, and we've posted that link in the Zoom chat. So let me just briefly touch on a couple of um, uh, uh, biographical details about each of our guests. Uh, Ms. Suad Aden Osman is the Executive Director for the Coalition for Dialogue on Africa. She also heads the Secretariat of the African Union High Level Panel on Illicit Financial Flows from Africa. 
In that capacity, she serves as the coordinator of the consortium to stem illicit financial flows from Africa. She has recently coordinated the preparation and adoption by the AU Assembly of the Common African Position on Asset Recovery, among many other achievements and accomplishments. Ms. Zadon Osman has over two decades of experience within the UN system, the Canadian government, and private sector institutions. Ms. Pamela Pierce Walsh is Senior Advisor for Conflict and Critical Minerals and U.S. Representative to the Kimberley Process at the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs in the U.S. Department of State. Her team works closely with consumer electronic companies, automobile manufacturers, and jewelers to develop coherent public-private approaches to vexing supply chain issues. Um, Ms. Kathleen Miles is Director of Analysis at the Center on Illicit Networks and Organized Crime. She is also founding member of the Alliance to Counter Crime Online. She is focused on transnational organized crime issues in Africa and on social media. And she has developed and provided on-the-job training to analysts in Africa in complex link and network analysis. So I'm pleased to welcome all three of these uh, distinguished panelists. Um, I think we'll have a great discussion here today. And I will kick it off now uh, by turning to Suad. Um, Suad, um, could I ask first, um, what are some of the key findings from the report of the high-level panel on illicit financial flows in Africa um, that should influence the strategies that African security and justice actors are using to try to counter transnational organized crime? And I'll ask you to spend maybe six or seven minutes if possible. Thank you, Catherine. It's 8 April. It feels like an 8 March of a panel of women. Um, the, the, the answer to your question is that we, uh, the high level panel on illicit financial flows looked at this matter and actually um, in 2010, when the, the definition of the whole concept was still not, not there. We used to talk about corruption more. Uh, and, and while we do understand and accept it, that corruption, according to the high level panel, is, a, is an enabler. Uh, we, they have, this, they have uh, defined the illicit financial flows as being proceeds of corrupt, criminal, and commercial activities. Uh, illicit financial flows, as far as we are concerned, is actually talking about flows. So it's anything that goes beyond the border of where the uh, activities are actually happening. And we also emphasize on the fact that we talk about source and destination because um, that's actually what, 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 what the whole illicit financial flows are about. Now, um, most of the interventions of the high level panel and the main findings are at policy level. Um, they, of course, brought out very significantly the, the fact that, that um, there is a lack of capacity uh, when it comes to our law enforcement um, um, units. And uh, because of the the diversity and the range of economic activities that fall under these kind of things and their corresponding financial uh, transactions. Uh, they, we have defined illicit financial flows from Africa as money that has been earned, transferred, or used at some point in that entire process illegally. So in other words, we're not, it's not illegal uh, financial flows. We're talking about illicit, so they remain on the border, meaning that the money could have been earned uh, legally in any jurisdiction, but the transfer will be done in a funny way. So then it falls again in the illicit financial. And we're talking about huge amount of money. At this stage, the figures of the UN stands at uh, 100 billion per year of these flows that leave the continent. So the, the impact on the, on the capacity of a country um, and what they could have done it when it comes to developing countries is huge. Um, in terms of, of um, the, the, how it, what the panel said could, would influence um, the justice actors and African security, one of the main things, precisely because it's 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 actually facilitated, we have holes. They're not necessarily bad people, but they're business people, right? They, so 
aggressive tax uh, planning is one of the ways, one of the main ways the bulk of it happens. Uh, then, um, then, I mean, tax and revenue, Revenue authorities and customs authorities that cannot verify the content of a declaration uh, cannot be the problem of, of, of multinational corporation of multinational corporations. So they most of the time have to rely on, on, on those declarations. And even if they detect that something has happened, uh, they and they took take them to court, they usually lose the case because they are now confronted with highly paid, highly skilled uh, the professionals that are basically facilitating this from, from, the, from the lawyers to the accountant, to, to the auditors, to the bankers. I mean, it takes a whole range of people to move this level of, of money. This isn't pocket money. And when it has, it leaves Africa and ends up uh, I would say Detroit, because Detroit is considered to be one of those platforms, then what happened? Because the US has standards. What happens with the multinational American, what the American multinationals when they operate outside of the borders of, but they bring back money is there. So we have been looking at all of these things, looking at the standards, ringing bells. And part of the main actions we have, as you, you said it at the beginning, was to foster the togetherness. We needed to forge positions and make sure that everybody has a common understanding of this thing and that the efforts, our, our individual efforts, when the results of them combine, they can actually relieve the situation. But um, it seems that it is growing uh, from the latest uh, data of the United Nations. So it is a phenomenon that is meant to make what is wrong right, right? Where it takes it from, from what is under the table and brings it uh, to, in, to the normal um, economy and, and, and banking systems. But they seem to be using a fully fledged financial architecture that facilitates these transactions and make what is wrong right. So it be, and it evolves. I mean, when we act, and, and countries, whether they act at unison or exchange um, information or do certain things, they find immediately another way to come, to, to, to come around it. At the end of the day, it's so the judges and the prosecutors are also target audience uh, of, uh, of our efforts. Uh, the professionals that have been facilitating this to make sure that uh, that uh, the it is a complicated matter to even uh, complicated transactions to even detect and and let alone prove that they are happening. So um, the I, I would say that um, unless there is coordination and coherence at national level, that all the national organized uh, and departments and and agencies. Uh, know what it is that we're talking about, they will not be able. So when they fall under different ministries, these are the kinds of holes that, that are used actually to, to facilitate these outflows. Um, so I think to, in response to this first question, the main thing to retain is that we need to recognize and accept that there is on one side the capacity issue of our law enforcement agencies. And then on the other side, um, heavily uh, capacitated multinationals that operate in seven countries and under the same region that flip flop and pass and go and use the holes and, and have a, a power of negotiations, even with these governments that when even we are trying to introduce laws that will close these gaps at the, um, for the, uh, in the uh, legal and, and institutional frameworks, they can intervene and block these kind of things. They are that powerful. So it's an effort that has been on for about 30 years. But sadly, when we attack it, it grows. So it, it is really a phenomenon that, uh, that people have to be. And so we, we only, all we can do is advocacy uh, so that we can recommend measures and actions to government to effectively address uh, the continuous loss of African assets and identify them and find a way to, to recover them. And during that recovery period, which is the litigation period that can take uh, a decade and decade and a half, the management of these 
assets, I mean, frozen assets and others are not left to those people who were already culprits in the first place, because in order for anybody to recover anything, you must have already indicted someone. So we usually hear a criminal in a developing country, but we never hear about the banks that are receiving these fundings because they also know that uh, this, this, this cannot be clean money. So let me rest my case here. I will be able to answer questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Swad. A powerful message about the need for coordination across ministries um, to deal with a very complex problem that, as you said, um, sometimes as you try to work with it, um, it metastasizes or takes new form. So a very challenging um, problem set that you've been dealing with. Could I follow up with a second question for you? Um, what actions can African security actors and civil society actors take, whether on the state, the regional, or the African Union level, to increase the effectiveness of anti-corruption instruments, anti-money laundering efforts, asset recovery efforts to dismantle some of these criminal networks. Thank you, Catherine. As I said earlier, uh, the main thing we do at our level is to foster togetherness and forge positions. So when we are able to come up with advocacy instruments that really um, unpack the issue and, 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 and so that we can come up with, with streams of work that are chewable for, for a group of, of actors who, are, who, can, who can act and, and try to stem these, these, these issues. Uh, it boils down to how much these recommended uh, measures and actions that are adopted at, at um, regional level, at the EU level, can be implemented uh, at the national level because implementation is a national issue and a policy uh, issue. Uh, so we have not been able to determine how effective um, the any all these recommendations that we have been making are at the national level, whether it is for the identification, the recovery or the management of assets that are, whether we like it or not, lost to foreign jurisdictions. Now, the civil society organization, private sector um, and, and the international community need to act in, in unison when it comes to uh, tackling this matter, precisely because uh, one of the things that we have seen happening, for example, is uh, a multinational when, it's, when civil society or parliament um, get a go after them in one country, they quickly move to the next one. Why? Because the minerals and are will, will be found in the same region. So they set them, even when they are negotiating, as they are coming and they wanted to make business, they will go to several governments and they start setting them to what we commonly call a race to the bottom to make sure that, and we end up um, not, and it's a very, very frustrating issue to African citizens because of the history of whether it's slavery or, or, um, or colonial, colonial days, there is a strong feeling that we, we don't get res value for our resources. We are rich in resources, but we don't, we, our people are poor precisely because we, A, of course, our, we, and we have to say it and admit it, we do have corruption of our officials, but the bulk of it, the bulk of it, and our panel actually was clear about it, that among the three components, the lowest is actually the corruption of our, our um, officials. It, it stands to up approximately 5%, 30% is outright criminal activities, but 65% of the outflows are actually proceeds of commercial commercial activities. So the behavior of the multinational that operate on the continent uh, has to change if they, because they will never be a perfect system and a perfect, they will always find loopholes in laws and, and capacities of the institutions that are supposed to be able to, to tell them no. So the standards that are used in the countries where they are from are absolutely not what they use when they come. So. Uh, and then there is also this attitude where when we push a little bit civil society, for example, we say, oh, be careful. The, you're actually, it's going to be counterproductive because you're now going to, to chase away the investors. 
but I don't know which kind of investors you wanted to bring in that are already setting their mindset through that. Now, when it comes to dismantling criminal networks, as far as we're concerned, we have not dealt with the criminal side. We feel that it is mostly attended to. What hasn't been attended to properly is really the commercial and systemic side of it, where you have multinational operating in ways that shouldn't be the case in poor countries. The, but we don't also want to continue to make it a moral issue. It is a systemic issue, policy issue, capacity issue, legal, uh, legal and uh, institutional uh, capacity issue. So we're trying to address them from that. Uh, from that. So, and, and you're right, it, it is a coordinated effort of the state the regional the economic communities and up to the, but then we pushed it beyond because we do say that based on the definition of our high level panel, money that is earned, transferred and used, uh, when you follow the money, it ends up in banks in developing, in developed countries, most of it. So you then wanted to say it's an African problem, yes, but it has a global solution to it when it comes to the policy level, because the, this deterrence cannot be only here. If everybody was blocking it at their level, then we may have still corruption, we may have embezzlement, but it will remain within the, and it becomes easy for, as far as we're concerned, to recover as opposed to taking it uh, abroad and now you are in other jurisdictions and so on. So, I mean, the, as we say, it's a broad issue. Uh, it's one that evolves and the actions and the, so that's the reason why, as far as we are concerned in the Secretariat of the High Level Panel, we still have and almost all our recommendations to implement. We foster togetherness, and it's about making sure that we all speak the same language and understand what it is that we are supposed to, to tackle. I hope that answers the question, Catherine. Absolutely. Thank you, Swan, for highlighting as well some of the key findings about the percentage of illicit financial flow issues that are related to commercial, criminal, and corruption um, issues, which, which is sort of a um, one of the highlights I took from some of your remarks here as you were discussing um, what we do about it um, and where we focus. Um, so this idea that the commercial element maybe is the element we focus least on um, as a community, um, whereas corruption and criminality, um, we, we do have some, some um, methods in place for, for trying to address those aspects. Thank you so much. Um, so Suad brought up um, several different kinds of criminal actors that we have discussed before in the webinar, um, state embedded actors, criminal networks, um, foreign actors um, who are also involved in the, um, the chain of illicit financial flows. And then of course the ENACT index um, also talks about um, what they call mafia style actors, but essentially conflict, um, conflict related actors who might also be involved in this. And so this brings me um, to some extent over to um, Pamela. Pamela, could I turn to you um, to ask two questions about your work on the Kimberley process and critical minerals in Africa? First, I would like to ask, could you describe to our audience what the Kimberley process is and how it fits into broader efforts to counter transnational organized crime as it might relate to, say, illegal mining in African countries? Sure. Um, thanks so much for the question and really happy to be here today. And I'm learning so much from my fellow panelists. Um, so uh, the Kimberley process is an international trade certification scheme. And its fundamental and primary reason for existence is to prevent the flow of conflict diamonds from entering the legitimate commercial supply chain. The KP was formally established in early 2003, uh, or I'm sorry, in the early 2000, in 2003, um, in response to uh, several civil wars on the continent of Africa that had been funded in large part through the proceeds of rough diamond sales. So basically armed groups were uh, funding themselves off of the proceeds of illicit diamond or of, of rough diamonds. And so the KP came together um, once this, those wars had, had ended, the diamond industry came, came uh, along with uh, governments and said, we have to do something to address this very specific issue. It came together, it, was, it formed itself around the definition of a conflict diamond, which is 
specifically a rough diamond whose proceeds are used by armed groups to fund themselves in their efforts against legitimate governments. So it's a very, very specific uh, definition of a conflict diamond. Now, if you're a member of the KP, it means that you certify and you're able to certify that any rough diamonds you export are quote, conflict free. So the KP comes with minimum standards, uh, legislative requirement, institutional requirements. Um, the, the necessary capacity is there to issue certificates that attest to this standard. It's not legal to import or export rough diamonds unless you are in a member state country of the KP. So if you're in a country that is not a member of the KP, you shouldn't be, there should be no import or export of rough diamonds. That said, rough diamonds are by, diamonds generally are by definition small, highly valuable and easily portable. So you can understand that it, there are very good reasons why rough diamonds generally are identified as easy tools for money laundering because they can hide a lot of value in very easy transportable ways. The Kimberly process mechanism for quote, controlling the flow of these diamonds relies on a certain amount of state capacity to actually issue the certificates. It's up to every member state exactly how they issue the certificates, but again, they have to conform to some minimum standards. And depending on the country, uh, they, the government may treat diamonds as a commodity differently. Um, in some states, it's considered a critical resource. Um, in other states, it's just a, it's just a product of commerce. Um, for example, if you're, you know, a trading center and not necessarily rich in in rough diamonds, versus actually a, a place where rough diamonds are are part of your geology. Anyway, the the certificate issuance aspect to the KP. Um, really speaks to the need for government oversight and, and capacity. I was listening very intently to the previous speaker's discussion about capacity at customs and borders. And you can imagine how a system like the KP certificate issuance can be a challenge for states with a limited capacity. Even states with a lot of capacity um, may also have corresponding high degrees of commerce and therefore a diamond shipment becomes one more thing that border security checkpoints um, or customs officials have to deal with. So even in states with high capacity, it can be difficult to monitor imports and exports of something like a rough diamond shipment. Um, I'll also say that with uh, rough diamond exports or imports, regardless of what, uh, what may be happening in a diamond supply chain for a rough diamond, the very narrow definition of a conflict diamond means that there are a whole range of activities that the KP doesn't address. It doesn't mean that there aren't other regulations in place that, um, that could still apply or that do still apply to the trade in rough diamonds or finished jewelry, but the KP itself has no fiscal oversight mechanism. It's not even, an organization, right? The KP is a trade scheme. It comes together for the simple purpose of members saying, we agree that this is the standard we're gonna live up to. It has a waiver from the World Trade Organization because it's basically a preferential trade scheme. And that's, the, and that's what countries agree to, to do. So there's not, there's not a mechanism there per se to exercise this oversight. The only country in the world with conflict diamonds under the KP definition is the Central African Republic. The Central African Republic is a, a beautiful country that has experienced in, uh, decades of instability, is currently experiencing some instability on the ground um, surrounding elections, surrounding the presence of armed groups, surrounding the presence of foreign actors. And, and half of the country, which is maybe rich in diamonds, um, is not able to export rough diamonds because armed groups are actively profiting off of rough diamonds from that area. 
Whereas another section of the country, the KP has worked very closely with car government officials to set out some standards that can attempt the KP to uphold some integrity of the process while also making it possible for the Central African Republic to, to continue making revenue off of its rough diamond supply chain. That notwithstanding, those efforts of the KP to really be supportive of the car government, there's an incredibly high percentage of cars rough diamonds from, from the KP approved zones that are still smuggled out of the country. Um, there are uh, porous borders. There's the existence of Transhumans, the, the uh, trade route that comes down from the north, from, from Chad and, and points beyond through CAR into Cameroon and on to other places. Um, there are uncontrolled airspaces where airplanes can go and you know pick up and set down. Um, and getting to the easy trans, uh, transportation of, of diamonds, you can understand how it's a commodity that lends, it, lends itself to an illicit flow. Um, I think maybe I'll stop there, um, but I would happy, happily take questions. Thank you so much, Pamela, for um, uh, the example of CAR and, and, and setting that within um, an explanation of the Kimberly process. And, um, some of the aspects of diamonds, yes, that make them maybe easily um, easily contributing to some of these illicit um, flows and to transnational organized crime. Let me follow up with one other question for you. So based on this work that you're doing on critical minerals in Africa, what have you observed about how the private sector and civil society can best be involved alongside state security actors in deterring those who are engaging in illegal mining or extraction during conflict. So what are some of the key successes or challenges that you've seen through the work you've done? Right, so part of, uh, part of my work is, uh, just to explain, is really an issue of nomenclature, right? Just words, uh, how do we define things? So um, a conflict mineral is, under US law is, is literally defined as tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold emanating from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, or any of its nine neighbors. That small subset of minerals, which incidentally are used for consumer electronics and automobiles, um, medical devices, jewelry, um, aeronautical equipment, those are actually, with the exception of gold, a subset of, of what the United States considers, quote, critical minerals. Now, a critical mineral is kind of unique to every country's needs, right? In the United States, we have uh, our US Geological Survey has defined critical minerals as 35 things on which the United States is import dependent and that it's necessary for our economic development uh, or security needs. So just to be clear, when I'm talking about critical minerals, it is a different thing than, than conflict minerals, although they, there is some overlap. The, the experience that I think is most relevant for this conversation pertains to that subset of conflict minerals. And I would offer that the, the more current approach to how minerals uh, are, are governed, loosely, loosely defined, um, is really about supply chain due diligence and corporate behavior. And I wanna contrast that approach to what the Kimberly process does. So in the KP structure, a government is responsible for certifying a standard and a quality about a product, a commodity. In the more, you'd never define, you'd never recreate the KP today, in my view, because the evolution of supply chain due diligence centers on requiring or imposing on corporations a review of their supply chains to meet a certain standard across a variety of categories. Pretend we're not talking about minerals, pretend we're talking about shoe leather, right? There is an entire issue of supply chain due diligence on the shoe manufacturing industry that attests to certain standards for things like environmental 
conduct or labor or, um, or, or climate impact, right? It's the same kind of concept across commodities to include minerals. So for conflict minerals, under Dodd-Frank 1502, the United States, what that means is that for companies that file with the US Securities and Exchange Commission, so publicly traded companies, are requested, required, that if they produce things that are reliant on those four minerals, to conduct a, a reasonable inquiry to, to discover whether or not those minerals needed for their products come from that region. And if they do, they're supposed to file a conflict minerals report that attests to the conflict-free nature of those materials. Now there's a whole um, industry apparatus and government's interest across the board about how back when that law was passed in 2010 to make it possible for companies to understand that. The principal policy tool or principal tool that the United States recommends and endorses to, uh, for companies to achieve that goal is the OECD due diligence guidance on sourcing minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas. And it sets out standards that companies should be able to investigate in their supply chains. And we can talk more about that in, in some detail. But for the purposes of, of this, I'll say that the constant, the approach of due diligence is about constant improvement over time. And that includes identifying risks to your supply chain and figuring out how you plug those gaps. So when you're talking about a conflict mineral, if you're talking about something that's enriching a, an armed group, you need to plug the hole in your supply chain and figure that out. Again, to the point of the evolution of commercial practice in this space, going from the KP and the certificate issuance to private sector due diligence, I'll say that whereas there is, I think, a perhaps natural reticence of companies to want to apply a lot of stringent due diligence for reasons that they would attribute to things like cost or overhead. There's been a real forward evolution from, from where I sit um, in the willingness of companies to understand the necessity of this work. And the most recent example of that is COVID and the impact COVID has had on supply chains. A company who may have met with me in December of 2019 telling me it wasn't possible to map their supply chains definitely learned a different lesson in early 2020 when COVID was impacting their operations around the globe. And so I offer that as an example for how companies, whatever the motivation, um, are definitely becoming more familiar and more uh, comfortable with the concept of, of due diligence for very basic business practice region, reasons. I think the larger issues that we're talking about today with proceeds of corruption and illicit transfer, I think those are, are exceptionally valid and fascinating issues. I am certainly not an apologist for the corporate perspective in my role as a US uh, policy advisor, but I think that they're like all things as standards are placed on companies and public perception is driving companies to take more responsible approaches. I think there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say ammunition, but for lack of a better word, a lot of really good inspiration and, and market force that consumers bring to bear on how companies behave. And I think corruption or illicit flows are one way that, that um, we could see that uh, public opinion become a little bit more, um, become a little bit more to bear on private sector supply chain. So I'll stop there. Many thanks, Pamela. Um, it, yes, lots of great insights about um, supply chain due diligence. Um, how very interesting point about how COVID has changed. Um, how you're seeing um, folks are reacting to that, um, and fits in nicely, I think, with some of what I will turn to Kathleen to ask now. So, Kathleen, could I start um, by asking you? 
from your vantage point as an analyst at CINTOC, what can you say about why these factors that we've been talking about, oversight, combating government corruption, anti-money laundering, and other economic regulation matters um, can affect African states' resilience to transnational organized crime? What have you seen about how those factors affect resilience in, in your work? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me uh, today, Kat. Um, so to get to your question, I think I, I, I like stories, so I'm gonna start with a story. Um, a couple years ago, I got the pleasure of working uh, in support of both the US DEA as well as on the ground actors in Kenya, the US DEA vetted unit in Kenya um, and Wildlife Direct, which is a nonprofit based in Kenya that does fantastic work on a couple different cases. Um, the biggest one for anyone who knows the name is the Akasha Network. Um, there were four individuals who were uh, eventually renditioned back to the United States or to the United States for the first time uh, after trying to move 100 kilos of heroin into New York City. Um, I think that that network is such a good example of how many different things have to pull in order to get things right. Um, and also all the different Thing, all the different tentacles that it, it touched. So ostensibly DEA really wanted these guys because they were moving drugs, right? So they had lots of heroin, heroin going all over the continent of Africa, heroin going all over Europe, heroin going to the United States. That's really bad. They also moved ivory, pangolins, uh, whatever it was. At one point, the guy, uh, you know, in an undercover op said, whatever you want in the box, I'll put in the box for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it there. Just let me know. And so he had a whole series of interlocutors and uh, individuals who worked for him sometimes, against him sometimes, to move illicit goods. I mean, whatever you wanted moved in and out of Kenya, they could do it. They were, you know, FedEx. And they had corrupted everybody in their path. So in order to really, um, affect change or to get them and, and to address sort of what they were doing on the heroin level, but also what they were doing in ivory and what they were doing in rhino horn and all these other issues, um, we had to kind of take a, a multi-pronged approach. So we started with support to DEA directly and support from State Department getting them extradited. We also worked directly with Wildlife Direct who did a really great job of monitoring courtrooms and making sure at the lower level, people were being held accountable and what was going on. And what that process really taught me was that you needed to line up every single uh, entity or every single group that was working on it. So from the US government to the Kenyan government, to the uh, civil actors, the nonprofits, the advocacy groups, Everybody had to be working in unison and everybody had to be pushing at every stage. Otherwise, we, we just wouldn't have gotten where we, we did eventually. And unfortunately, I will say, so the four individuals were extradited and I will put this, I think mostly on the American sh shoulders is that we didn't hold up our end of the bargain of going after the corruption side of it. Um, and we really did not push heavily afterwards to root down on some of the corruption issues that were going on both with international actors and actors inside Kenya that had assets elsewhere. So I think it's a story in what you can do when everything goes right and you have everybody pushing and then where you can still improve at the end of the day. Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for that illustration um, through your work with the Akasha Network and how all of these different factors sort of align in terms of how we need to think strategically about how to um, deal with these issues. Let me ask you a follow-up as well, Kathleen. Um, I know that you also conduct trainings on complex link and network analysis in your work. So could you summarize for us what that is and describe how you've seen um, African security colleagues of yours using that kind of analysis to address um, corruption or other factors related to transnational organized crime happening um, partly in their countries? Um, I, I think uh, complex link analysis and, and network analysis is just a, a fancy term for what we do is on the job training. So I've had the privilege of working with partners in West Africa, Southern Africa and East Africa 
on various networks. And in each case, um, the criminal networks that we were looking at are complex. Um, they're rooted usually transnationally. They have contacts both uh, across the African continent as well as external to the African continent. And they are uh, very resilient. Uh, I think the most resilient people I know are all in criminal activity. Um, their ability to sort of pivot on a, on a, a dime is, is amazing. So what we've done and, and where we've worked a lot with our African colleagues is sort of looking at an individual problem and then going back and forth and sort of, you know, thinking through, okay, who's important here? Who's working? How do they connect to each other? And you, you map the entire network and how it works in the supply chain. And then you say, what can I affect? Because just because something's really bad doesn't mean, unfortunately, that you have the ability to change it. You're looking for leverage points in the system that you can affect and, and have action. And sometimes that means having a lot of little actions across the board. So again, I'll go back to the Akasha example. When we mapped the supply chain, we were actually coming at it from an ivory point of view. We were trying to figure out where the, amount of, where the most amount of ivory was leaving the continent. We figured out it was Mombasa, Dar es Salaam, and then actually out of um, Entebbe, out of the airport. And what we figured out was it was the same network that kind of controlled all three of those port access and that they were moving everything that was illicit. And so to really affect that, we, you have to one, get somebody who can do a multi-state, multi-transnational action, which are very few actors. I mean, I think the US is one of the few governments in the world that will impose their laws extra, <laughs> extraterritorial. So we leverage that, but then also leveraging individual laws inside Kenya. So um, figuring out, you know, we worked with Wildlife Direct to figure out every single um, law that they broke around ivory, every single law that they broke around corruption, every single law that they broke around money laundering. And then we brought each of those cases forward in each of their jurisdictions simultaneously and supported them. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about training and stuff, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, um, you know, the, we end up in a lot of times in classrooms and talking, and that's very important to learn the framework. But what I learned in my process is like going back and forth with the analysts themselves and, you know, them sort of bringing a problem forward, us asking the questions, brainstorming back and forth, and then, you know, going forward and, and figuring out the right solution for that moment, which might not be the right solution two years later, it might not be the right solution in the next country over, it might not be the next, you know, in the next network, it might not be the right solution, but it's the right solution for that moment at that time. Um, and it's really an iterative process that we go through. Thank you. That's a really illuminating um, uh, description of what it is that you found to be effective in the work that you've done um, in partnership with your African colleagues in different parts of the continent. So thank you very much, Kathleen. Well, um, I think that um, I want to thank all of our three panelists for their excellent insights um, from their work on these topics. Thank you all um, participants in the audience for following the conversation. I hope you've been finding it useful so far. I see some questions have been typed in. So I think um, that's a good sign. We will now move to the question and answer portion of this session. Uh, where we will continue to record the meeting. Um, I urge you to type further questions you might have into the Zoom chat. Remember, you can type your questions in English, French, or Portuguese. Um, and to kick things off today, um, we're doing something special. Um, we will have uh, one of a member of our Africa Center alumni community um, come onto video and pose the first question. So let me switch into French here and introduce the person that we have doing that today. Today we have Dr. Chow from Senegal to ask the first question. He is a specialist on the international protection of human rights in crisis situations in Africa. He um, has a degree from the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., and he is a general officer of the Gendarmerie, 
and he is currently the commander of the gendarmerie. So Dr. Chow, welcome. And the floor is yours for two or three minutes to ask the first question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, to have invited me to participate in this discussion. I learned quite a bit. I'm very honored to be with you this morning. And thank you to the panelists for the clarity of your presentations. I have learned quite a lot, especially since we are very interested in uh, security issues in Senegal, in terms of Kenya and uh, West East Africa, West Africa. We also have these same problems, of course, of the um, illicit financial flows. And we also have this problem in the sub region, um, perhaps not with diamonds, but in the east part of Senegal, we have areas um, of clandestine uh, crime um, and networks. And all of the entire East Africa community and also with Burkina Faso, Mali, Ivory Coast, in, in this particular region, we we uh, need to study these problems of trafficking, of human trafficking, of uh, that we're having a difficult time with. So it's really a very concerning area for us. And so the question of a regional approach. Of course, uh, uh, ECOWAS and the African Union are seeking to address this in a regional context, a regional approach. And I believe the states sometimes do not speak the same language and, uh, and that creates security problems. And I think we need to look into this further and perhaps you can tell us about this, the importance of this regional approach. And Madam Pamela, I really enjoyed and appreciated uh, the uh, information on the Kimberley process, but I, am, I have a question. I feel that the Kimberley process, perhaps it's not mandatory. Is it, is it sometimes um, creates obstacles? And in terms of other uh, other minerals, critical minerals, is there also a process for other minerals? And thank you very much for having invited me because these are really very important central questions to security in our region. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the question. Can you hear me? Good. Um, for the Kimberley process, I think the the question about you know the the the, the blockage of it, if you will, um, in, into expanding into other minerals, um, it's it it was an it was a forum born of a very specific time for dealing with a very specific commodity that had a tremendous amount of um, industry support, as well as an inherent um, desire by producing states to control that commodity. Market-wise, at the time, there was also somewhat of a monopoly on the global trade of rough diamonds. And so those forces really combined to get everyone moving in the same direction, if you will, for how to regulate it. I said in my remarks, you would never recreate the Kimberley process because in many respects, it's a very inefficient method for expecting a government 
often oftentimes with limited capacity, but even in cases of a lot of capacity, it's still very difficult to regulate. You'd never do it that way now. When people ask about gold, gold is a tremendously lucrative commodity, even easier to transport and make money off of than diamonds. And the destruction associated with it in artisanal form is exceptional, particularly when the use of mercury is introduced. Um, nonetheless, it's a commodity that appears in different ways, um, in, in different geologic pre uh, presentations. And regulating that from a government standpoint would, in my opinion, be even more inefficient. Not to mention the fact that the KP just deals with that one aspect of the conflict nature by one armed group. It doesn't say anything about official violence. Uh, should there be police officers involved in violence against minors? It doesn't say anything about environmental standards, which are part of what degrades um, countrysides in countries that have a lot of artisanal gold. Uh, it doesn't say anything about labor standards. Uh, and so uh, the, the requirement on private sector operators to understand where their product comes from is in many respects a stronger impetus a stronger driver of change. At the same time, there does need to be strong domestic and international regulations on supply chains, because I don't think that it can just be laid at the feet of private sector. It has to also come with the oversight and involvement and support of official actors. I'll stop there. Merci pour la question. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Um, let's, uh, I'm gonna add a question or two to the mix as we turn to Suad and Kathleen um, to do a round here. Um, so we do have the question from Dr. Chia to um, Suad, but Kathleen, if you have ideas on this as well, what kind of regional approach is needed to deal with illicit financial flows? Um, particularly, it sounds like on the um, regional economic community level, what, what can be done? Um, I would encourage um, Suad and Kathleen as well. There's been another question posed. Um, what resilience can be built against illicit financial flows at community levels? Um, so there's a question about the regional economic community level, but also the really local level. Um, what are some different ways that we can build resilience in these two domains? Um, let me turn maybe to Suad um, to address um, one or both of those, and then we'll, we'll come to Kathleen after that. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, in response to Dr. Chow's question, it's true that when a phenomenon manifests in a country, it also shows up in neighboring countries in the same way. That's why we have a tendency to see things when we're talking about East Africa. Everything that we saw taking place in Tanzania, uh, you're of course going to have take the things that are going to pop up in Kenya. And the same goes for the ECOWAS region. Now, when we're talking about the African Union, which is an instrument of the member states. So um, now in terms, we can talk about a case study. We, we don't actually look at who did what. We're more looking at what recommendations need to be made at the level of the state. We try to make them speak the same language in terms of the definitions and in terms of illicit financial flows. It's really, this has really come up only over the last five years. Why are we talking about these? Because when you know we talk about many things that are perfectly licit, perfectly legal, but that are morally unacceptable. You cannot stop someone 
uh, who sees a gold mine from taking their bucket and trying to get some gold. And so you cannot stop a multinational from profiting from gaps in legislation, uh, in laws. That, that's what they do. That's uh, essentially, and, and they plan to pay as little in taxes as possible. Now, if we use a regional approach to attack this phenomenon, um, I, is it effective? I don't know. I've been working on this for 12 years. Okay, beyond the fact that we know what we're talking about, we know how it's done, uh, that we have a way of looking at this. Uh, when we get to the point of how do we fix this, then we necessarily get to the point of what is the capacity of the states that have to manage this? And, and then we get to definitions. So when you get back to the level of uh, ECOWAS, for example, uh, going from the African Union level to the ECOWAS level, uh, for example, a lot of countries uh, in ECOWAS have the same currency. So, it, you know, all these criminal activities facilitate getting money out from these resources and passing them off through channels. So, you know, but the economic actors that are doing this, uh, the, the government just wants to make sure they, they are paying the taxes. If we cannot determine how things are done, who is impacted? Uh, it's not even um, not even five percent of the profits from these activities remains in within the country. It goes does these profits go elsewhere? Why does it go elsewhere? Who are these people who need to still get more? Uh, so the average African who is angry say resources are going to the colonialists. So we have to sort of avoid this because whether we want it or not, the countries are open to this international uh, trade. We have to manage it. But you know, when you're going from one jurisdiction to another, for us, in terms of African countries, I, I'm in agreement with Pamela, you know, who's saying it is kind of goes everywhere. What's going? Um, on in Central African Republic is goes elsewhere. So the borders are porous and they're even more porous when we are talking about illicit methods. Now for us, what is, um, you know, when we're talking about these means to transport these items, because the true value of these minerals, the, the value is assigned abroad. So as the president of Tanzania um, said, you, you can say, okay, you have uh, 15 container ships leave. It's just rocks, sand. It's when it gets elsewhere that it's assigned value. So did we, as, is it when you assign a value to the minerals that you have a problem or is it when you take, dig up rocks and, and earth at, at the source? It doesn't have a lot of value for Africans, but when it's been transformed into gold, that's where there's value. So where is the problem, you know, the value chain, as Pamela said, is extremely important. So how does it come out? How is it transported? What, what, when you have a customs official at the border who allows a truck to go through, maybe he received a thousand dollars. We can evaluate that $1,000, but you know, what did he let pass through? A hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars. How do we know? So, to what extent is this important for us? So our level or our work at the continental level, at the worldwide level, we have to look at the value of what is recorded in Belgium 
based on natural resources coming from D the DRC. I mean, these are huge numbers. We we don't we can't even say it's about criminality or corruption in DRC. We you know really want to go after the people who are attracting these activities, who are motivating these activities. Um, there was someone who the the former president said illicit financial flaws. It's the modern version of colonization. It's essentially extraction of resources without paying for them. Okay, we can't self-flagellate about this because, because I, I'm not going to talk about how much uh, civil servants are paid in, in these governments. I mean, it's, it's not going to stop this criminality, but we have to talk about the markets on the outside who are motivating these illicit resource flows. And so what are the norms in those countries? So with the Kimberley process, we were able to do this with diamonds. But she, as she said, it's, it's an illusion to, it's illusory to, for a government to really think they can stop this through this. Now, can we expand this? to other minerals, we, you know, now we get to political diplomatic activities and we don't really have real responses to real problems. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. If I could to uh, specify, I'm very satisfied with your answer, but from a legal standpoint, Africa has instruments. I am talking about the AU's border program, which is insufficiently used from my point of view. And I think the states have an interest in, in making it better. Now in the West African region, the issue of the free uh, mobility of goods and people. Maybe we need to strengthen controls uh, because it's security issues that take priority, you know, because before developing the economy, we have to get to stability. Uh, that's what I wanted to add. And thank you so much for your response. I am absolutely in agreement. We said the big problem is the problem of capacity. So in terms of laws, in terms of documentation, the instruments are present. It's the same problems we've had for 60 years. We've thought about the solutions. They're there on paper. They've been adopted, but it's the implementation that is something else. Um, Thank you. We have about five minutes left, so we're um, running low on time relative to the number of questions people are enthusiastically posing. So I think what I'll do is to turn to Kathleen next um, to get her in the mix. Um, there is a particular question that was directed to her that I'd like to read out. Um, uh, somebody from our audience says, this is uh, an admission of the epicenter of Africa's challenges um, was this Akasha case. And so um, he says, the bust on the Akasha brothers was big news. What action do we expect in dealing with those players who facilitated activities of these brothers? We have always, um, we have lawyers and judges that were adversely mentioned and still free and available, probably to facilitate the next present or future Akashas. Um, so there's an inquiry about sort of the future of what could be going on related to the case that you worked on. So I wanted to pose that one to you and then also say to um, you know all three of the panelists, we still have this um, question about community level um, resilience building. If, if we have time to take that after um, Kathleen, if you want to take both, feel free. If you want to take just one, feel free and then we'll see what time we have left. Otherwise, we'll address some of these questions in the open discussion for whoever can stay. So Kathleen, over to you. Hi, um, so I will say, I, I know that there are still quite a few folks who have been uh, called out and named and shamed in the Akasha case who are still in members of the judiciary in Kenya, as well as uh, I believe all the way up through the higher levels of government. And I think this is one of the things that you know, internally, I don't want to tell a country what they should be prioritizing. I don't think that's my position, but it is 
something that, you know, when people go to the polls and vote or when people are making these decisions to have that in mind and, and have it at the forefront. And I think some of the, you know, the nation in Kenya did a really great piece on parts of the Akasha. I think more of that needs to be happening. Um, I also, you know, I, I spend a lot of time on Jumeo forums, which is a Tanzanian based message board. Um, I think those forums have a lot of success in publicizing and bringing light to, hey, this person is consistently taking bribes or this person is consistently involved in these things. I'd also like to see action internationally on some of these folks. I know money has gone overseas. I would love to see uh, asset forfeiture and uh, repatriation of assets back to Kenya on some of this stuff. Um, I unfortunately don't know if that is going to be happening, but it would be lovely to see it. I also think um, just on the regional question, LATF was a great resource on the Akasha case, um, specifically on one of the ivory traders and I am blanking on his name, no, Shenny. Um, you know, like he, LATF, which is, um, you know, cops that have the ability to arrest people. So a Kenyan police officer who can go to Tanzania and arrest somebody and bring them back to Kenya because they're working underneath a treaty is an amazing ability. And the LATAF officers worked across four different countries to bring this network down. And it, you know, they don't get enough credit when it comes to that, those cases, specifically around ivory. I mean, so it was the Shenny case and then it was the, um, I'm blanking on the brothers' names, uh, not the Akasha brothers, but the, the Ivory brothers that were smuggling back and forth. And so if you're looking for a regional approach that works, I would highlight LATF. I mean, they definitely, you, you know, with everything, you, you always have uh, issues that can be improved upon, but they've done a phenomenal job going across different countries and helping to work to one common good and goal. Thanks, thanks, that's great. Um, there's some related questions that have popped up. So let me just ask one in the one minute that we have left. And I think we'll have Suad um, address it because this question is addressed to her specifically. Do you have a confirmed list of known multinational corporations who are culprits? And how are AU member states alerted of those corporations? Are there any traceability mechanisms? So I'm wondering if um, you have an answer to that and or if you could give us a plug for the seven case studies that you're um, that you've been doing on the high level panel of different countries and how they've been dealing with these things. No, we do not have a list of names uh, to give out on, on these multinationals. These things must take place at the national level and our authorities taking care of this. We, we are doing studies, we're providing recommendations uh, in order to close these loopholes, these legal loopholes and to increase capacity. Now, in terms of the cases that we are assessing in terms of uh, illicit financial flows, now up to that point, we had used um, country cases, because this is something that is hidden, something that is taking place under the table. So we have to estimate. So to get closer to reality, to a real number, we really, you know, it, it's if you have a country that is rich in natural resources, if it's a post-conflict a country that is very porous, they operate in a different manner. Now, if it, there's a country where there are some big economic actors that are linked to the presidency, it takes place in a different manner. So we've evaluated the different ways this takes place. So it really, it's different depending on the profile of the country uh, in terms of its economic, political profile. So the cases that we chose to study were, were to really reinforce what we already knew and, and then to look at, in terms of a, a specific country, we wanted to look at the systemic aspect, not the criminal aspect. So we wanted to see this would not happen if you had this in your laws. So we have to buy um, databases, uh, improve public markets. These are the types 
of recommendations, improve procurement. And those are things were supposed to be implemented in 2020, but we think we've lost 2020 and we've probably lost a good part of 2020. It's not moving along very fast because, you know, we, we need to get people to really prepare. There needs to be a high level of advocacy at the national level. People are afraid. Some people are involved themselves, so they're afraid that if information comes out, it will impact them. So we're navigating this situation and everything we find, we send to the African Union. And it, you know this can be good for countries that are in a similar situation, but this is uh, basically recommendations we make to agencies uh, that are involved at the national level. So it's time. I am going to thank each of our presenters, also as well as Dr. Tiaut for having posed the first question.